Okay. Alright, so we're talking about some structure of bacteria. We actually stopped talking about some something inside of bacteria now. Alright, so uh, now uh, just a few things, okay, that bacteria are different from eukaryotes, okay? So prokaryotes don't have uh, a true nucleus, they don't have membrane bound uh, organelles. Alright, so uh, prominently missing is the membrane bound nucleus, okay, membrane covered nucleus. And then the way they package in is also different, okay? So they lack of nucleus and no histone proteins. Uh, cell wall for bacteria made of peptidoglycan and some other chemicals, okay? So uh, uh, peptidoglycan is a unique cell wall to bacteria. We'll take a look at the structure of that later on, okay? So, all right, the structure of prokaryotic cells, okay? So all cell possess these things, okay? So uh, cell membrane, okay? So uh, all bacteria cells still have cell membrane, cytoplasm. They still have ribosomes to make proteins. Right, so and they still have some form of cytoskeleton, okay, which is uh, internal uh, uh, support structure, okay. So uh, eukaryotic cells have a lot more organelles, okay, but uh, bacteria still have the basic cell membrane. It's universal to all life forms. Uh, ribosomes, okay, the organelles to make proteins are universal to all life forms as well. All right, so and then cytoskeleton. These are also universal to all forms of life, okay. So. Anyway, so, uh, and then uh, the cell wall, the glycocalyx, we'll talk about that. Some bacteria may have that, okay? So some, but not all, bacteria may possess flagella, outer membrane, plasmids, inclusions. We'll talk about all of these structures, actually. All right, so this is a slide to talk about the, the details of the structure. It's kind of small, so I'm going to make it bigger. All right. All right. And, uh, so this is some of the, uh, uh, the structure of that you will, will come in will come in contact with that uh, you need to know about in bacteria. All right, so with the outside, you can there might be little hair sticking outside. These are called fimbriae, okay? Hair-like bristles extending from the surface help in adhesion, okay? These little fimbriae hair. Uh, some bacteria have a two layers of cell membrane. We'll discuss that in just a moment. And then, uh, now a lot of bacteria may have, uh, uh, every bacteria would have a cell wall, okay? So every single bacteria should have a cell wall that's a semi a rigid, uh, casing that provides structural support. Okay, so uh, this gives the, this protects the bacteria. Okay, so uh, so bacteria usually won't uh, undergo osmotic lysis. Okay, bacteria have a rigid cell wall that can actually withstand osmotic lysis. All right, so some bacteria may have a capsule. Okay, not all bacteria have it. Some bacteria have a capsule, which is an outer layer of uh, of uh, uh, of a glycocalyx. Okay, so uh, of uh, of sugars serve as a protective ad adhesion, adhesive stuff, okay? And then uh, uh, sometimes it could be uh, loosely uh, uh, associated with the cell wall and it's called, just called a slime layer, okay, glycocalyx. Uh, uh, there's definitely DNA, you can see here, definitely DNA, the cytoplasm and definitely bacteria definitely have a chromosome. Uh, ribosomes are just scattered throughout the uh, cytoplasm of the bacterium. And then uh, uh, some form of cytoskeleton here, actin cytoskeleton, okay? So bacteria do have some structural support as well, internal uh, cytoskeleton. Uh, occasionally you may see these inclusion bodies, okay? So that's uh, not all bacteria may have it. Some of these may have these inclusion bodies as storage organelles. Uh, they may store starch, they may store polyphosphate, they may store uh, other types of, uh, they may store fats sometimes in the type of bacteria, okay? So it's like a storage organ. And then uh, a lot of bacteria also have extra bits of DNA called plasmids, okay? So the chromosome, uh, its bacteria has its own chromosome. And then bacteria also likes to carry uh, extra bits of DNA. These are called little circles of DNA called plasmids, okay? Now the chromosome is much longer. The chromosomes we're talking about five million base pairs of DNA or so, okay? So uh, bacterial chromosomes usually contains about 5 million like, base pairs like ATCGs, how many letters of uh, uh, genes, uh, how many letters of DNA. We just look at the DNA structure and then uh, bacteria have about 5 million base pairs of those. But a plasmid is typically much shorter. A plasmid is like 3,000 to 20,000 base pairs of DNA. Okay, so it's a much shorter uh, string of DNA. How many base pairs of DNA do we have in each one of our cells? Does anybody know? How many base pairs of DNA, how many letters ATCG that we have in each one of our cell bacteria is about five million. Guess how how many do we have? More or less than five million? More, more right? You would hope it's more. We have more complicated bacteria. <laughs> we have more complicated. We don't have a lot more genes, but we have about uh, we have about three billion base pairs of DNA. Okay, 
okay, so the letters A, T, C, Gs, okay, so bacteria have about 5 million or so, but we have about 3 billion base pairs of DNA in our cells, okay, so we are not the most complex of this, rice actually has a lot more DNA than, than we do, okay, so rice actually, a lot of this junk repeat DNA, but then, um, and then, uh, uh, we definitely, we actually don't have the uh, highest, uh, largest number of DNA per cell, okay, so, uh, um, I said a lot of organisms actually contain a lot more DNA, okay, but, but anyway, so this is, uh, the bacteria, now, uh, we will talk about some endospores too, so these are some, uh, some bacteria will form spores. Alright, so, uh, now bacteria are very diverse in size, okay, some bacteria, uh, uh, most bacteria in the range of one micrometer, one to two micrometer. That's the range, but the smallest one could be under 0 0.05 micrometer. This is called nanops, okay, very small. And then the biggest one that people have found is about 750 micrometer. Okay, so some bacteria are big. Uh, this is visible even with the naked eye, almost. And then this is uh, some bacteria are very small. Okay, so all right, so uh, yeah, very uh, in as shapes and sizes. We'll talk about the different shapes and sizes right now. Uh, now, when we describe bacteria, there are two basic shapes that you hear all the time. The coccus shape, which means round shape, versus the bacillus shape, which means rod shape. Okay, so when we talk about bacteria, uh, typically you hear people something something coccus, streptococcus, staphylococcus. The coccus refers to the round shape. If you look at them under the microscope, they are just tiny little dots. Okay, all right, so. Now, a lot of bacteria are rod-shaped. Some of you did look at some bacteria yesterday. Some rod-shaped bacteria are called bacillus or bacilli, okay? So in uh, coccus or cocci, okay? So coccus is uh, singular, cocci would be, uh, or cocci would be in, uh, in um, the plural. All right, so these two basic shapes, coccus versus bacillus, okay? So you should definitely know these terminology when we study microbiology. And uh, there are some other weird shapes too. So vibrio means a curved rod, okay? So vibrio, you can see that the rod shape is kind of bent, okay? So these are called vibrio. And then there's some spiral shape. The two spiral shape is spirulum and a spirochete, okay? Spirulum usually have like two or three turns and they may actually have flagella sticking out. You can see here, they still have some hair flagella sticking out. Whereas spirochetes usually have more turns but no hair sticking out. Spirochetes usually have more turns, uh, but they do not have any hair sticking out there. They, they do have flagella, but they have in entirely internal flagella, okay? So that's the difference between a spirulum and a spirochete, okay? So uh, bacteria can come with all different shapes, okay? So uh, what do you think these spirochetes bacteria could have? They look like a, they look like a little corkscrew. What do you think they're good at doing then? These spirochetes bacteria. They're very good at in other places. They do, like for example, Lyme disease is a spirochete bacteria. They do uh, infect your central nervous system. Okay, they can drill and penetrate your central nervous system, hide out in your nerves. Uh, syphilis is also a spirochete bacteria. They can directly drill the placenta. They can, if your mother is infected is with syphilis, they can directly cross the placenta and actually give the baby uh, uh, congenital syphilis. Okay, so these are spirochete bacteria. Right, so uh, yeah, so the, we have these different shapes, okay? Now you probably don't see this one too often called branching filaments. These are some uh, uh, quasi um, streptomyces. These are some and, uh, bacteria that look like fungus. They're multicellular bacteria, actually. So uh, and, uh, some bacteria do exist in multicellular form, and then these cells they clump together. All right, so let's go back to coccus. So to the basic shapes in cocci, we have these two basic shapes, streptococcus versus staphylococcus. All right, so streptococcus means a chain of uh, coccus bacteria. So streptococcus, okay, so the chains of cocci bacteria. And then uh, when they're just four packed together called tetrads, and then uh, a bunch of irregular clusters are staphylo, okay? The term staphylo means irregular clusters. Uh, Staphylococci and Streptococcus are the two most important uh, uh, big classes of gram-positive bacteria that we'll study, okay? So, strep throat, for example, is a uh, kind of Streptococcus, uh, Streptococcus pyogenes, and then uh, Staph, like uh, skin infection, MRSA, okay? And which is Staphylococcus aureus, okay? So these are the two uh, most common um, coccus shape of bacteria. And then, uh, Okay, so let's take a look at some other bacterial structure now. We'll take a look at the bacterial cell uh, uh, flagellum. Now, a lot of bacteria can swim, okay?
Okay, so uh, they do so with a simple uh, filament sticking outside, and this thing just rotates. Okay, this is called bacterial flagellum. This thing just spins. Okay, so it just undergoes a 360 rotation. It spins. All right, so uh, some bacteria may have one flagellum, monotrichus. Some bacteria have a bunch, lophotrichus. Some have one on each end, that's amphitrichus. And then all over the bacteria, these are peritrichus. Okay, so bacteria, flagellum come with different shapes like that. All right, so uh, now this video explains bacterial flagellum motion quite well. We will take a look at that. All right, so. Most motile bacteria move by means of flagellum. A flagellum is a slender structure about 15 to 20 microns long and about 20 nanometers wide. A typical rod-shaped bacterial cell is 2 to 3 microns in length. The bacterial flagellum is composed of three parts. The basal body, which is embedded in the cell membrane and wall, a short curved segment called the hook, and the portion that extends out from the cell called the filament. The basal body consists of rings that correspond to the layers of the cell envelope and therefore differ in gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria. In most gram-negative bacteria, there are four rings connected to a central rod. Gram-positive bacteria have only two basal body rings, one connected to the cell membrane and the other to the cell wall. Motility is mediated by proteins associated with the plasma membrane and basal body and is powered by the proton motive force associated with the plasma membrane. The filament is a rigid structure which rotates to move the bacterial cell. Spirochetes are motile by means of bundles of flagella, called axial fibrils, that run along the cell within the periplasmic space. The number of fibrils varies. These axial fibrils extend from both ends of the cell within a flexible outer sheath. Spirochetes have a screw-like motion which allows them to bore into mucoid layers yeah. and soft agar media. Some bacteria lack flagella or axial fibrils, but are motile if they are in contact with a solid surface. This type of movement is referred to as gliding motility. For some gliding bacteria, secretion of a slimy polysaccharide appears to be involved. Other bacteria appear to have special proteins on their surfaces that mediate gliding motility. You see bacteria do move, okay? They swim, <laughs> they uh, glide, and then uh, they do move, okay? So this is how uh, uh, a lot of bacteria actually motile, okay? Uh, noticeably, a group of bacteria that doesn't move are actually these streptococcus and uh, staphylococcus. Mm -hmm. These bacteria are generally don't are not motile. Okay, so these staph and strep, but a lot of rod-shaped bacteria are. Okay, so they have flagella all over the body. They actually will swim or they glide. Okay, so uh, now this explains the motion of the video called chemotaxis. Bacteria like to swim or towards a stimulus or, stim or swim away from a, uh, from a stimulus. Okay, so. Yeah, so let's take a look. When Escherichia coli moves in a medium that lacks a concentration gradient, the cell travels, stops, or tumbles, and then continues moving in a new, random direction. When the flagella rotate counterclockwise, the flagella form a tight bundle and propel the cell forward in a run. After a brief period, the direction of rotation is reversed, causing a tumble. As cells move up a chemical gradient, runs are longer than when they travel down the gradient. The overall result is random movement in the absence of a chemical gradient and movement toward a chemical when a gradient exists. Attractant chemical. Actually, you don't have to know all the rest of the details. So you just need to know this uh, term in bacteria, uh, uh, this term called run and tumble, all right? So uh, because uh, bacteria are very small, when there's no chemical gradient, they're still swimming around, but they, that they're like, but they're like drifting in a randomness direction. It's called run and tumble. Okay, so uh, uh, they can also, they rarely can swim in a straight line either, except for spirochete bacteria. Spirochete bacteria may swim in a straight line, but most bacteria don't swim in a straight line. And then when you look at them, they actually look like they look like, like, look like they're going all over the place. They look like they're going like that. 
Now, the motion that you describe it is called run and tumble. Right, so uh, you don't need to know all the chemical details of how that works. The video is a lot more detailed talking about all the, all the, uh, uh, how it's actually all controlled, but then uh, you don't need to know all that, okay? So. All right, so that's the structure of the flagella. Okay, it's a spinning motion. And uh, now let's talk about some of the interesting uh, 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 structure that you may find in bacteria. So this little hair that we already seen, these you can. This is a real electron microscope image. Right, so these little hair on the surface, they are usually good for attachment. Right, so these fimbriae, they are used for attachment. Now occasionally you actually see bacteria joining each other with these tubes. They actually form a little tube. These are called pillars or pili. Okay, so pillars is singular, pili. Uh, plural, right? So uh, these tubes actually join bacteria together. The process is actually called conjugation, right? So uh, it's uh, a way that bacteria actually exchange DNA with one another. Okay, so bacteria actually do that. They form little tubes, and then uh, bacteria are usually asexual. Uh, they don't undergo sexual reproduction. They do not form sperms and eggs. Okay. However, they do exchange DNA with one another. They actually love to exchanging DNA with one another. And then uh, they do form these tubes that actually joining the bacteria together in a process called conjugation. We all know what conjugation means, okay? So, and then uh, it means mating, okay? So, uh, and uh, bacteria do do that. They do exchange DNA with one another. Now, we'll talk more about this process in detail in chapter eight when we get to that chapter. But uh, for the first exam, you just need to know the term conjugation. So uh, I have a question asking you when bacteria, or what structure is responsible for that? The pillars is a structure. When they form tubes joining together, pili joining together, and then they're undergoing a process called conjugation. Okay, so, so bacteria do do that. Now let's take a look at the sugar coats, the glycocalyx, okay, sugar coats. And then uh, you need to avoid uh, uh, the sugar coat is actually that helps the bacteria either adhere uh, to each other, okay, forming uh, it could be a slime layer, which is like a sticky layer, okay, so you can see here. Uh, it can actually be quite a bit bigger than the bacteria itself. You can see the bacteria is here. Then it makes it secretes a lot of sugar, like sticky substance, which actually helps the bacteria glue to each other and helps bacteria form a uh, 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 a slime layer of bacteria. Right, so uh, now these are called biofilms, okay? So uh, the congregation, aggregation of a lot of bacteria, they could, they are universally present in virtually any wet surface, right? This is the DM picture of a catheter surface. And then uh, any bacteria gets stuck in a, uh, in a wet surface. Bacteria like to congregate in wet surface they are present anywhere you see some mortar, you know, along your sink, all right? So they are present, uh, very prevalent in your sponge, okay? So uh, if you leave your kitchen sponge uh, for a few days, how does it smell like? It's bad. bad. When you touch it, how does it feel like? It's slimy. Slimy, okay? That's exactly what these are, okay? So, uh, and uh, yeah, so there's a, anywhere where there's a wet surface, where there's uh, uh, water can be trapped uh, on the solid surface, and where there's a little bit of nutrients, such as your kitchen sponge. All right, so uh, there would be a lot of these biofilms formation. Okay, so biofilm uh, formed by aggregation of bacteria. They are usually formed by bacteria secreting this slime layer and then aggregating with each other. Okay, so, so that's, uh, yeah, so they're everywhere. Okay, in your shower curtain, your kitchen sponge, there, yeah, like anywhere where the surface is a little bit of wet. They are also present in your teeth as well. Your teeth is a perfect substrate to form biofilms. Okay, the plaques from your um, when you floss. Okay, the little the white gluey stuff, the plaques. When you, so uh, your mouth is always wet, and then um, and then uh, the biofilms forming all over around your teeth. Okay, so uh, and then uh, uh, if you leave them. Uh, unattended, they're going to cause problems, okay, they're going to cause tooth decay and, you know, gingivitis and all that, okay, so, uh, yes, yeah, so this is all biofilms. All right, so now there are also a thicker coat called the capsule, you can see here, this is the bacteria, and then there's a thick coat like that, okay, this is called a capsule, okay, so, now capsule uh, are more tightly attached to the bacteria than the biofilms, um, 
but they actually help uh, the bacteria escape from the immune system, actually, because they help the bacteria enhance uh, uh, pathogenicity. Okay? So they usually 